This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV. This Week in Virology, a special episode recorded on December 13th, 2017. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. I have a returning guest. He was on TWIV not too long ago, but we didn't finish. And so I promised when he visited New York City, we'd have him back. And here he is from Harvard Medical School, Sean Whalen. Hi. Welcome back. Thank you. You're, you're visiting our department today. Yes. And um, I assume you've been to New York before, right? No, I've I've never been to. No, of course I've been to. <laughs> <laughs> right, many times. Okay. Yeah, the first time was 1994, actually, to give a seminar at Mount Sinai. Okay. Well, we have saved very cold weather for you. Absolutely. But you're used to it in Boston, right? Um, it's cold there too. But what I'm not used to is wearing short sleeves mm-hmm. when it's so cold. It hurts. Yeah. And here in my office. Uh, we have condensation on the inside of the yes. windows, which we've never had before, but apparently this year they're injecting humidity into the air. Ah. And uh, you can kind of smell it. Yeah. And it's condensing because the windows are so cold today. Hmm. But it's gorgeous. It's a nice day today, isn't it? It is. You have a good view, too. It's lovely. I'm very lucky to have this. I've had this since uh, 1990s, and uh, I'll miss it when I leave. But I have the Hudson River. Mm-hmm. George Washington Bridge. Mm-hmm. I can see hawks. You may see some during our little chat here. You may see helicopters. Huh. <laughs> Once a, a 747 carrying the space shuttle flew by. Wow. And a plane once flew by on the way to landing in the Hudson River. Oh, of course. I wasn't yes, here, the though. The USOS shuttle, yes. I was, I was in Switzerland, and I saw it on the news. But if I had been here, I might have been able to watch it. It would have gone right past my window. So it's a good view. All right, last time uh, we talked, we were at uh, Tufts, and we talked about your early days and your early work on VSV, polymerase structure, replication, but we didn't touch on your other interest, which I think, I'm not, I don't have to think, I know, is virus entry into cells. Yeah. Now, you, you talked about an experiment in the, I think in Jeff Allman's lab, where you tried to Another way, how did it work? Target polio to a different cell? That's right. They're putting a ligand on the on the surface, but it didn't work because we know the receptor is, is a catalytic encoder, right? Right. So was that your earliest interest in virus entry? <laughs> it certainly was. And um, because of the difficulties of, in fact, that very question, how do you get poliovirus to bind to an alternate receptor and infect a cell? Um. We could get it to bind to lots of things. Yeah, never enter, right? Yeah, not to productively infect. Um, I I guess I sort of steered clear of entry for a little while Mm -hmm. after that, (laughs) Um, but came back to uh, study entry um, really when my first graduate student uh, approached me. Mm -hmm. um, And I was a, a relatively recent faculty member at Harvard Med School and um, David Curitan, uh, a, a graduate student from Georgia, in fact, approached me and said, I, I'd like to work in your lab, but I don't want to work on anything that you work on. <laughs> it's a good way to get in, right? <laughs> uh, of course. I thought, wow, somebody who has a little bit of independent yeah. thought. Yeah. And uh, he said he'd like to work on understanding how VSV enters cells. Yeah. It's always good when someone has an idea. Yeah. yeah for sure. Yeah. Okay. So that's how I started working on entry again. What year roughly that was? Uh, so David came to my lab in 2005, I believe it was. Okay. Um, maybe 2004. Um, and since then, you've been interested in entry. And as we'll see, you've worked on a lot of different viruses, which makes me um, remember that when you were introduced today, you were host and Moscona put up a picture from Facebook which said after, what, X years, still working on the same virus. But in fact, you're working on a lot of different viruses. Yes, but I use the same virus. As a tool, yes. Uh, Yes. 
So it's it's almost like cheating on your virus, but not really cheating on your virus. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. That's right. I still love you, right? <laughs> um, I wanted to go over a couple of really interesting papers that you uh, are on and, and projects that you've worked on, which use some interesting technology. And, uh, and if we have time, I'd like to talk about VSV as well. Uh, but the first one would be the Ebola virus um, paper from 2011. Ebola virus entry requires the cholesterol transporter Neiman Pick C1. And tell us how you came to do that. So um, I, I think this is probably one of the most fun uh, experiences that I've had as a scientist, getting involved in this whole collaborative effort um, to really understand how Ebola entered cells. So what actually happened uh, was um, – a little bit previously to 2011, probably 2009, I'd learned of um, a scientist called Tyne Bremelkamp, who at the time was a fellow at the Whitehead Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And Tyne had perfected insertional mutagenesis in a haploid human cell line. And uh, I'd heard had used that approach to understand influenza virus infection, amongst others, and had rediscovered the importance mm. of silic acid. And I heard that this paper was going to come out in science. And so I approached Tyne and said, uh, um, would you be interested in looking, in looking at VSV? And so sure enough, we did a screen. Um, and The screen uh, is, so you, t let's talk a little bit about the haploid cells. Sure. So why haploid? Well, the problem before was, uh, you know, it, a si so a single copy of a, uh, uh, each chromosome allows you to use insertional mutagenesis by a retrovirus. Mm -hmm. um, and you only have one copy of each gene to right. inactivate. So um, if you have multiple copies, then um, which some cells have four or five copies of some right. genes. Right. Um, but if you have more than one copy, then the chances of you inactivating uh, okay. both chromosomal copies is obviously significantly less. So these haploid cell lines, they're pretty rare, aren't they? Yes. And did, did he make it or did he? So it was derived uh, from a, a chronic myeloid leukemia mm -hmm. uh, uh, patient that where the cells had been isolated at Tufts uh, in Boston uh, many years before. And I can't remember exactly how many years before. Um, uh, and those cells were largely haploid. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and so Tyne had, uh, basically isolated from those cells by, and by through expression of transcription factors made them more adherent, but isolated a fully haploid cell line. Um, mm. why would a tumor have haploid cells in it? Yeah. <laughs> um, we don't really know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, I, I mean, really, this is, I mean, the why is Who knows? A, it's, a, just, a, 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 an interesting question. Yeah. But, uh, They're just defective cells, and if someone looked hard enough, they found haploid cells, I guess, yeah. So you, and to use these for screening, the idea is to look for cell proteins that are needed for the virus to replicate, which includes entry and replication, the whole thing. Right. So the haploid cell line has to be permissive and susceptible for your virus, right? That's right. And um, they're derived from a tumor, right? You yes. Said. So, and what kind of tissue is it? Do we, do so, we, uh, it was from a chronic myeloid. Myeloid yeah. cell, which might not be good for all viruses. Right. But, of course, VSV infects everything, so. It does. <laughs> it's not a problem. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, even if you spheroblast yeast and mm -hmm. fuse the virus at the plasma membrane. It'll replicate. And you wow. can get the virus in, it'll replicate. So a screen is you infect with the VSV and you look for cells that are surviving, basically, right? Yes, yes. That was your first screen. Yeah. And what did you find? Um, well, we never published what we found, um, yeah. but we didn't really find anything of any significance. <laughs> that would explain not publishing it, right? <laughs> so, so we were a little bit. No so, cells grew out, in other words. Uh, actually, we did get some and they had insertions in P53, but. Um, Why would P53 protect them? Well, uh, it's a good question, and uh, it you touches you on so many. Huh? Well, it touches on so many processes. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, figuring out what was happening and 
whether or not it was a real hit. Uh, yeah. Uh, was that surprising to you that you didn't get anything? Well, it was disappointing. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, the motivation for doing the experiment <laughs> was to find what VSV needs for infection of these cells. Mm-hmm. Um so uh, what do you, how do you interpret that? It needs nothing? That can't be, of course. Um, well, it's a pretty good virus, but it does definitely need more than the five proteins it encodes. Yeah, but, yeah. So my interpretation is uh, twofold. One is that the things that it needs are essential, and therefore we can't inactivate them. And the second is that some of the things I the see. virus needs are redundant, and therefore it can use something else in place. That's an important point, that this haploid screen is only as good as the library of disrupted cells. You can't knock out every uh, gene in a cell, right? Because some of them are essential. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. Okay. okay. If you could do some conditional knockout, that would be better, but that's tough. Okay, so you had no results, and what did you do next? Uh, so then, um, actually, two things happened. One was we realized that it was going to be a terrific tool to probe the entry into cells of pseudotypes of VSV. And the second was that a a postdoc applicant to my lab, a guy called Matthias Garben, uh, approached me about wanting to work on VSV and wanting to work on this problem. And so Matthias, uh, Tyne, myself, and Jan Karet met one day at the Whitehead Institute and decided to look with VSV Ebola. Mm. Um, so pseudotype means VSV with Ebola glycoproteins. In place of the uh, VSV glycoprotein. And is that something you'd already made? So that virus was first made by Heinz Feldman. Okay. Uh, and Heinz made it when he was in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And Heinz very carefully made that virus under biosafety level four conditions because we had no idea whether such mm. a virus was going to be safe. Yeah. And so what Heinz did was he made the virus and demonstrated, in fact, that it was not only safe, but was actually a vaccine candidate and has become Mm. the vaccine that was used in uh, 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 and is now approved for use in in humans. Um, And that's just regular old VSV with Ebola glycoprotein substituted for VSV and no other mutations as far as we know. No other mutation. And it's attenuated in… Non-human primates, I guess they've done phase one already, right? Uh, it's been in people. Yeah. Um, there was uh, some slight reactivity, yeah. well, some reactivity in one of the uh, trial sites, but the virus is approved for use as a vaccine. Um, I think generally the view on using such VSV, uh, uh, recombinant VSVs, is that something that would help attenuate the virus so that uh, any possible uh, neurological mm. or neurotropism is uh, uh, suppressed um, and any possibility of uh, adverse symptoms. Mm. Mm. So I, I, there are a number of people who are interested in attenuating the virus uh, okay. further um, through all sorts of strategies, yeah. polymerase-mediated attenuation being one that we're working on, and um, but other people are trying alternate approaches. Okay. So you decided to put that virus through your library. Through the haploid screen. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the basis of this paper, I presume, right? It's exactly the basis of the paper. And there you got something, obviously. Yeah, we (laughs) hit the jackpot. (laughs) Now, tell me, technically, you infect, how many cells would you infect initially? Millions, tens of millions, billions? Uh, I think it was about 100 million cells. Okay. Okay. and uh, uh, you, you want to – the library is made in a way that gives you one inactivation per cell roughly, right? Um, so the, actually there's multiple inactivations okay. in, 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 in many cells. It turns out that with the sequencing at the end, it falls out because something that depends upon another gene mm-hmm. for, its, uh, sure. for it being a hit just falls out in the noise of the sequence. So in practical terms, you take a plate of cells, you infect them with your virus, and then – Take the surviving cells. Do you just pool all of them, extract DNA, and sequence it? Pretty, Pretty much. much. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it's a little bit more complicated than that, as um, uh, simply because in some cases you can overkill the cells, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and in some cases the infection isn't sufficient. Right. 
Um, and both of those are bad. Right, so you've got to right. get the, the right level of infection so that the uh, enough surviving cells that you can identify something and yet that, um, that are examples of viruses we may discuss one later, uh, where if you use, uh, enough virus, you can infect cells independent of the principal yeah. attachment factor. And so you can miss biology that, is actually quite relevant for the yeah, virus in sure, question. Sure. Um, now, in these papers, you express the, the data, sequence data, as these plots where you have genes ranked by chromosomal position and then you have the significance. Yes. And they're circles. Yes. Small ones. Yes. And then bigger and bigger yes. and bigger ones. Right. Yes. So that's the output of the screen in the end, right? It's all based on sequencing. And, it's and, all based on sequencing. And you, you have some tag in the um, retrovirus that you can use. Yes, so it's PCR, a, right? it, yeah, it's a gene scap retrovirus, and you sequence into the surrounding gene, and mm. that tells you where the insertion was. Right, so you don't have to sequence the whole genome then, right? Yeah, you use deep sequencing. And, okay. Uh, and then the size of these circles, like I see here, I, I have this first paper up, NPC1 has 39 in parens. Yes. What does that mean? You got it 39 times? Um, so there are 39 independent insertions okay. um, that were enriched for in the selected uh, set of cells, so the cells that survived infection, over the unselected data set. Mm -hmm. so, Got it. Um, so the, the size of the circle is, uh, is uh, um, a reflection of both the number of times the, uh, any single insertion mm -hmm. event occurred that was selected for, and the bias of those for directionality. Um, so NPC1 mm -hmm. in this case was the largest, the single most significant hit in the screen. Um, Although that's not always an indicator of what is important, as I heard today, right? <laughs> uh, this is correct. Sometimes. And as you'll, as you'll notice on the data from that screen, the only... Uh, known essential host factor for Ebola entry uh, prior to the screen mm -hmm. was endosomal cathepsins. Mm -hmm. And cathepsin B, in fact, is a hit in the screen, but it's only a small little spot. That CTSB? That's right. Three. Yes. It's, it's amazing. Yes. <laughs> it's only three. Now, when you saw these data, and by the way, the, you have a red line and below which there are lots and lots of tiny... Yes. And those are just noise, you think? Uh, they don't meet the cutoff of okay. significance in this. There may be gems in that noise, but yeah. Um, yeah. but your chances of finding them are uh, significantly harder. Someday a student will come to your lab and say, I think I know what one of those is doing. Would you let him work on it? <laughs> um, if, he had, if he or she had a good convincing proposal, right? <laughs> uh, I, I'd want to very quickly see some data that indicated <laughs> right. that there was some relevance to whatever the hit uh, uh, or lack of hit turned out to be. Now, in this uh, screen, did you immediately go after NPC1? So we had a number of discussions. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, at this time, we realized that it would be useful to involve uh, in our collaborative effort um, other people uh, and so we reached out to uh, Kartik Chandran. Who, mm -hmm. um, in fact, Kartik had discovered Cathepsin B when he was a postdoctoral uh, fellow in Jim Cunningham's lab. And uh, I'd known Kartik uh, mm -hmm. since his time as a graduate student in Max Nybert's lab. And, um, and so uh, we started discussing this with Kartik. And what we had noticed was MPC1 was a hit, but MPC2 is not a hit. And the way that MPC1 works is it takes cholesterol esters from MPC2 and then transfers them across mm -hmm. the membrane. Mm -hmm. So if the role of MPC1 was related to its role in cholesterol biosynthesis, then we should have gotten MPC2 right. as well. And we didn't. Um, and so that sort of offered a clue. Um, the other components that we got were cathepsin B mm -hmm. and the hops complex. So the hops complex sort of made sense, a transport factor. Cathepsin B is an entry factor. So what's MPC1 doing? It's clearly the most significant hit in the screen. And hops is involved in 
and, and acidic tra- transport. transport. Right. Okay. Um, and NPC is Neiman Pick C1. That's correct. Which is because it's the gene that, that's defective in people with that cholesterol with disease. Yeah. Disease. And uh, it's one of uh, uh, there are other genes that. All right. And NPC2 obviously is one of them, right? Yeah. So what is the next thing you did uh, with that? Did you? You don't have any cells with just NPC1 disrupted at this point, right? So we were able to get some, both primary human mm-hmm. cells. From a uh, patient, right? From a patient. And demonstrate that those were resistant to infection with our VSV Ebola. And that that resistance was overcome by expression, overexpression of uh, a wild type copy of NPC1. Mm-hmm. And so this really, uh, together with experiments where we'd used zinc finger endonucleases to inactivate an MPC1 uh, and overexpression of MPC1 in those cells, right. again supported that MPC1 was really playing a role uh, in infection. Uh, and we focused on entry as the most probable mm-hmm. uh, step. Um, the, the interesting thing here is that NPC1 is endosomal, right? That's right. <laughs> So many factors had been identified previously as mm-hmm. being the Ebola virus receptor, but they were principally molecules at the cell surface and none of them was really essential. Um, so, I, I, you know, we, we were surprised that this was an endosomal molecule, but what we knew about uh, uh, Ebola entry was that there was likely the role of well, the role, in fact, of uh, endosomal cathepsins is mm-hmm. to cleave off this glycan cap that decorates the, the glycoprotein and protects and shields what had actually been termed by Erika Ullman Sapphire, the mm-hmm. receptor mm-hmm. binding domain mm-hmm. that's highly conserved. And so, in principle, this notion of having something that could bind to a number of molecules through a fairly non-specific interaction at the plasma membrane, and then get internalized, and then undergo a cleavage event that exposes the highly conserved receptor binding site, really was what excited us about this intracellular membrane protein that could right. potentially be uh, a receptor molecule. Yeah, I thought that was a really nice new paradigm for virus entry this immediately went into our textbook yeah uh, because we teach principles and that's a new principle that there's an endosomal receptor right yes and it all makes perfect sense to protect the receptor binding domain until the the virus gets inside the endosome it's just great (laughs) there are obvious advantages to i mean avoiding neutralizing antibodies that target that too yeah. yeah um and so then you You've since published uh, a couple more papers using the same system. And by by the way, and before I ask you about that, now if you weren't lucky in having NPC fibroblasts and you wanted to disrupt NPC one to prove that it were an entry receptor, back then what would you do? We used we did that very experiment. We used mm-hmm. these zinc finger endonucleases. Okay. Okay. Um, and today, now, of course, we would just, would just use, use CRISPR. Gene, <laughs> yes, gene editing or CRISPR. Yeah, of course. Okay, then the next paper is uh, the Lassavirus receptor. So I suppose after your finding of the NPC1, you decided to expand it? Yeah, we realized that this was a very powerful approach to looking for virus receptors um, and molecules important in entry. And so we uh, started to generate many, many different viruses uh, These are all pseudotypes, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, Unfortunately, polio is excluded because you can't pseudotype with anything from polio. There are no uh, glycoproteins. Uh, right, there's no glycoprotein. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, we started to, and we were a little bit conservative at first. We used type, uh, we used single uh, uh, glycoproteins that we felt could be mm-hmm. uh, incorporated into the virus. Uh, and so we made several arenavirus uh, mm-hmm. pseudotypes, actually. Um, but the one that yielded information next was the Lassa uh, uh, virus pseudotype. Which, by the way, was a paper we did. Uh, we did 
both of these papers on TWIV previously. We did the NPC one, and we did this science paper, which is the Lassa receptor. I'm looking at the uh, figure. It has a couple of pretty big circles. In fact, now we're talking in the 1900 and 1700 numbers, as opposed to 39 for NPC one. Yes. So you just looked at more cells, I guess, right? And there was more extensive mutagenesis that was done of the of the cells. Now, what strikes me that's really interesting, you look at this, do you have a name for these uh, plots? The bubble plots. Bubble plots, good. Yeah. That's good. Like heat maps is a nice name, bubble plots. The two big ones are large and ISPD. And do they have anything to do with LASA entry? Yeah, so it was known, in fact, going back to a very nice paper from the group of Michael Oldstone mm-hmm. in the late 90s, the glycosylated alpha discoglycan uh, was uh, required for or important for not only Lassa virus infection of cells, but also another arena virus, lymphocytic choreomeningitis virus. Um, and so, in fact, discovering that alpha discoglycan and enzymes involved in its mm-hmm. glycosylation, so large or things involved in its traffic, um, was really what we a significant part of the data on Earth by our screen. Um, there were two uh, things. Um, so, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Tyn Bremelkamp had uh, realized that there's a whole human genetic disorder associated with the lack of correct presentation on the surface of uh, cells of glycosylated mm-hmm. alpha discoglycan. And uh, he talked with. Um, uh, a colleague in the Netherlands, Hans van Bokhoven, and it turned out that uh, Hans van Bokhoven had a cohort of patients who uh, had a um, dis- discanoglycanopathy uh, that's associated yeah. with the incorrect presentation. And it turns out the screen on Earth, two genes that mm-hmm. he verified in, in patients and, mm. and families who uh, had exhibited this disorder. Um But what we were interested in from this screen was really, is there something else Mm -hmm. that's required uh, for Lassa virus infection besides alpha-DG? And that was basically for two reasons. One is when Mike Oldstone's group discovered that alpha-DG was important for Lassa and LCV, LCMV infection, it was also recognized by by the same group. that in fact, at very high multiplicities of infection, you could overcome this requirement for glycosylated alpha DG and still infect mm. cells. Um, and so we were interested in what this alpha DG independent mm-hmm. uh, pathway was. And so that's what we'd hope to identify in part from this screen. So the idea is that if you had enough viral particles, even if you don't have the surface attachment protein, enough viruses will bump into the plasma membrane and get taken up and then... Or stick to something stick. else, yeah. heparin sulfate maybe. Or <clears throat> Now, the, the, the protein here is LAMP1. Yes. But if you look at this bubble plot, it's a tiny circle. Yes. 19 hits. Yes. Now, how did you hone in on that? So we did a subsequent screen mm-hmm. in cells that lack alpha-DG. Okay. And that unmasked the importance of LAMP1. That should be a figure here, right? It is. Here is figure... Well, figure 1, LAMP1 is 127. And uh, figure 2... No, that's not it. It's figure 3. It's now less. Is figure 3 the... Uh, oh, maybe it's another figure. Uh, anyway, I, I remember that, that you, you used yeah, those so, cells. So and, by looking in alpha-DG null cells, the, the importance... Uh, um, of LAMP1 was, yeah. So now without LAMP1, the cells cannot be infected, even at high multiplicities. That's right. Um, we can't infect the LAMP1 knockout cells. Even if you have alpha-DG on the surface. Even if you have alpha-DG on the surface. So uh, LAMP1 is also an endosomal protein? Like it's a lysosomal protein. Lysosome many past people, the endosome. Yeah, yeah, many people know about LAMP1 since they marker. use an antibody against <laughs> <Yes>. LAMP1 <laughs> as a marker for lysosomes. Uh-huh. Um, it's on the inside of the, lys- the lysosome, is that right? So it's a transmembrane protein. Mm-hmm. There's a portion on the inside, and there's a portion that's basically still on the outside of the cell. Um, and so uh, 
that would have to be using the portion that's on right. the outside of the cell, essentially the luminal portion. Mm-hmm. So how does that function in Lassa virus infection? So that turned out to be really rather clever. So for Lassa, what happens is it binds to glycosylated alpha-DG at neutral pH, but as you acidify the conditions of looking at that interaction, by pH 6, that association is undetectable in Mm. uh, Mm -hmm. pull-down-type experiments. And as you become more acidic, you can begin to detect, well, pH 6, you can begin to detect an association, but by pH 5.5, which is the pH around which you can see fusion, you Mm -hmm. can see a strong association with LAMP1 uh, that we could detect. And so this was evidence of a Mm -hmm. pH-regulated receptor-switching molecule. And that sort of makes sense because as the virus is uh, exposed to increasing concentrations of protons during its entry into cells, the glycoprotein is going to undergo conformational rearrangements and expose different portions of the glycoprotein. And so that to us was very reminiscent, in fact, of how cathepsin cleaves the glycan cap of Ebola virus and exposes Mm -hmm. a highly conserved receptor binding site. Um, So we sort of wondered if the same thing was really going on here with uh, alpha discoglycan and LAMP1. And and LAMP1 ends up being a fusion receptor? So uh, the link between LAMP1 and fusion, Mm. um, uh, certainly if you target LAMP1, you you can trigger fusion in the presence of LAMP1 and and, uh, acid pH. But is LAMP1 sufficient or is anything else required Mm -hmm. um this paper does not definitively show that nothing else is required Uh, but certainly that Mm -hmm. was the model and uh subsequent structural data argues that uh there is a a a direct interaction with lamp one um the relationship between lamp one binding and fusion uh is Still not one hundred percent clarified. Now, in this paper, also you mentioned that birds, chickens, yeah, don't have a lamp one that binds uh, that's right. virus, right? Why that's did you good. Why did you do that? So uh, again, uh, so it was known from the literature that chicken cells have perfectly functional glycosylated alpha discoglycan on their surface and yet are resistant to Lassa virus infection. So why? And it turns out that there's a critical residue um, at position 87 that gets glycosylated, and it's the glycosylation that's important, Mm. in fact. Um, And that's key for the interaction with Lassa glycoprotein. And uh, um, interestingly, in the uh, screen that we did, we also found the glycosyl transferases that are important in yeah, this, yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 glycosylation. So uh, again, these screens can really quite deeply mm-hmm. uh, reveal biology. It's just a question of trying to figure out how it fits together. Do you think this uh, observation in birds is a random mutation, or was it selected at some point for resistance to infection? Probably not chickens, right? Yeah, I, 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 it's difficult to see that it uh, was a selection against Lassa infection based on the geographic distribution of Lassa and, <laughs> right. uh, uh, and the rodent host of Lassa. But, yeah, um, yeah. yeah, but it does demonstrate that you can have a perfectly uh, 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 functional LAMP1. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, uh, you know, what is LAMP1 doing? Um, so we knew. Uh, in fact, that mice that lack LAMP1 mm-hmm. are perfectly viable. So what is LAMP1 doing? Um, mm. So uh, uh, it turns out those mice are also completely resistant to Lassa virus infection. And that was an experiment that John Dye yeah. uh, had done. So all of the work that we'd done um, with wild type Ebola virus in the first paper and in this paper with wild type Lassa virus was all done by John uh, mm-hmm. 
uh, at the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute in Fort Dietzkick. Mice infected with Lassa, are they healthy or do they get sick? They get sick. Well, then they should just release some lamp no mice into the wild <laughs> and they should overpopulate, right? <laughs> Eliminate um, the reservoir and that'd be the end of Lassa. <laughs> uh, well, the uh, I mean, it would have to be in the multimammate mouse, mm-hmm. which is the rodent host, um, which is actually quite unusual. So, And I'm not so sure how well a genetically engineered sure. mouse would survive. <laughs> it's quite, so, kind of like putting releasing Wolbachia-infected mosquitoes, right? Yeah, and plus our biocontrol efforts have uh, <laughs> not always been uh, yeah. successful. Who knows what a LAMP1 deficient multimammate mouse would do? Yes. By the way, during your talk today, Dixon de Pommier asked you a question. Ah. So he's uh, one of the co-hosts on TWIV. Yes. And he um, was here. So when these nurses started getting sick in Nigeria with Lassa, Mm -hmm. um, one of them, Penny Pinio, was airlifted here to Columbia. Ah. She was just put in a 707 passenger seat and flown here without any precautions. (laughs) That's the way they did things. She recovered. They saved her serum. Right. And then Jordi Casals had been working at Yale on Lassa virus. He's an arbovirologist. Right. And he got sick. Turned out he lived in the neighborhood here. It's about two hours from New Haven. So they brought him to the hospital, and they gave him her serum, and it saved his life. So that's a mm. cool story. So yeah. if you read the book Fever by John Fuller, right, uh, which is an accounting of the discovery of Lassa, that that uh, story is in there, and and. Many people here at Columbia are part of the story. So that's where Dixon was coming from. Ah. He was here when that happened. I was not. Right. In the 70s. It's a cool story. Yeah, it is a cool story. And he was uh, asking me if there was anything different about the last sequence based upon mm. um, the relative <laughs> amounts of human to human transmission uh, uh, versus rodent to human transmission most of the infections are rodent to human right well uh, certainly it's not as common to see human to human transmission mm-hmm. as uh, another arena virus that we've looked at um uh so um i mean it's always difficult i mean you can there is examples of human to human transmission Sure, transmission, sure. but it's difficult to dissect in many cases whether the transmission was from a rodent to a human or uh, human to human. Well, I mean, the, the the early infections in Nigeria, there were only a handful of them, so it's hard to make any conclusions about transmissibility right. compared to today. But you said today there are up to 300,000 infections a year, right? 300 to 500,000. a lot. Yes, yeah. So are most of those primary contact with rodent excreta? So um, I don't know what fraction of rodent mm-hmm. human and what fraction a human human um but certainly in terms of human human transmission it's not as transmissible as other yeah hemorrhagic fever viruses so that's that brings us to lujo and that's the one you kind of mentioned where there's more human to human transmission right it's diff- so the numbers are so low yeah it's hard it's very difficult to be certain why did you start working on lujo so, uh, Lujo is an outlier to what we knew about la- uh, about um, uh, arenavirus entry. So, um, the sort of emerging dogma had been that the New World arenaviruses used transferrin receptor as a receptor molecule, and the Old World arenaviruses, Lassa and LCMV use glycosylated alpha discoglycan as receptor. And uh, when Lujo was discovered in 2008, um, it was realized that its glycoprotein was somewhere in between the sequence of that of the old world viruses and that of the new world mm. viruses. And yet Lujo had arisen. It was uh, associated with a fatal hemorrhagic disease in Lusaka. Um, and four of the healthcare workers that cared for the primary infected patient um, became ill. And mm-hmm. in fact, three of those four died. Um, the one that survived, um, it was realized, in fact, that 
the through sequencing uh, of the arenavirus genome that again involved people who are here. Yeah. Um, Ian Lipkin. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so it was realized that uh, this was an arenavirus and a new arenavirus. And so ribavirin was given to the patient that survived. Um, so that demonstration that this was an arenavirus really mm. had a, a, a significant impact. So ribavirin is this um, sort of wonder drug with many <laughs> mechanisms of action um, uh, that have been hotly debated um, and discussed uh, on this show, I'm uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, certain of. Um, but it can be, uh, I mean, its principal target is IMP uh, dehydrogenase, um, but it can also be incorporated by viral RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, um, so there are a number yeah. of mechanisms. Where it acts as a mutagen, right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so we were interested in Lujo simply because okay. this yeah, was a virus yeah. that used neither glycosylated alpha DG nor a uh, um, transferrin receptor. By the way, the New World arenas, do they also use LAMP for fusion or for? Uh, that's a really good question. And we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but for, Reasons that will become, I think, more obvious. We believe there is some other molecule mm -hmm. that is important for the infection of cells by those viruses by other than transferrin receptor. And in fact, we're actively looking for such a molecule. Mm -hmm. Of course, there may not be. Uh, right. They may be different. Um, but we hypothesize there may be another molecule. So the Lujo paper just came out in November 8th, right? Cell host microbe. Yes. And um, did you use the haploid we did. cell library yes. again? Yeah. Yes. So this was… Uh, this is called Hershey Heaven. Did you know that expression? <laughs> um, I I don't know the expression, but I can imagine what it is. Well, Al Hershey yeah. and Ch Martha Chase developed yeah. this yeah. kitchen blender experiment yeah. for yeah. finding out what part of the phage goes into yeah. a cell, right? Yeah. And he just just do that over and over again and get right. a paper every time with a right. different virus or whatever. And it was called Hershey Heaven. Right. <laughs> so if you have a system, you just use it over and over in different uh, to ask whatever different viruses, different cells, and you get papers every every time. It's a little derogatory, but it's in fact, why not? If something works, use it. Right. Yeah, and you know the biology of these are all different. They all use yeah, different molecules and. And it's sort of interesting to discover what's different to them. Um, so well, let's see. Can I find the uh, bubble map here? Here we go. Figure one. <laughs> yes, it's frequently figure one. And now we have heparin sulfate biosynthesis. So that... Yeah. Was that known that it might be involved in attachment? No, it wasn't. Uh, in fact, we didn't really know very no. much about Lujo virus uh, attachment and infection, although data had been published that mm. demonstrated that if you block, uh, if you inhibit alpha discoglycan biosynthesis or use an antibody that blocks new world arenavirus use of the transferrin receptor, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that uh, Lujo uh, glycoprotein can still mediate infection of cells. Um, so um, we identified a, a fair number of genes involved in heparin sulfate biosynthesis. And heparin sulfate um, is often associated with adaptation of virus to cell culture, but is right. actually really fundamentally important for pathogenic virus infections in a number of mm -hmm. cases. Mm -hmm. So um, Pat Spear demonstrated its importance in herpes simplex type 1 many years ago. And uh, uh, more recently, uh, I believe it's the work of Bill Klimstra who demonstrated that it was important for um, uh, pathogenic eastern equine encephalitis, so an alpha virus uh, uh, infection of cells. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think while many viruses can adapt to use heparin sulfate, other viruses, it is a relevant host factor for their biology in the uh, natural environment. So you also have here uh, Golgi trafficking genes. Yes. What's that about? 
Um, it's not fully clear um, why they were important. Um, that would be on the way out, you would think, right? Right. <laughs> um, so uh, they could influence the uh, location mm-hmm. of uh, other membrane proteins, for example, which are screen unearthed. Um, and in some screens that have also identified heparin sulfate using this methodology, mm-hmm. um, this complex, the conserved oligomeric uh, Golgi complex, has been identified. So it may be related to heparin sulfate, or mm-hmm. it may be related to okay. some of the other proteins that were identified. Um, but it wasn't um, one of the factors that we, at least in this paper, elected to follow up on. However, you did follow up on the three pink ones. Yes. Sure. You put, you put here uh, receptor candidates. They're NRP2, CD63, and TMEM30A, which, and TMEM30A had the most hits. Yes. So what did you do with those? So again, each of those genes was uh, knocked out uh, right. in the haploid cells mm-hmm. uh, to verify independently that they uh, impact infection in the haploid cells. And in addition, um, they were knocked out in endothelial cells um, to determine whether in Mm -hmm. a cell type that's more relevant for infection by Lugovirus, uh, whether they were important. And while they all verified as being important for infection of the haploid cells by Mm -hmm. VSV Lugo, TMEM30A fell out in the analysis of uh, infection of uh, endothelial cells. So you can knock it out and you'd still infect the yeah, cells, right? Yeah, we could still infect the cells. What is it, do you know? Yeah, so it's an interesting protein, and we actually got quite excited by it because um, it's responsible for uh, flipping phosphatidylserine from the outer leaflet mm-hmm. to the inner, back to the inner leaflet. Um, so... We know that many viruses use phosphatidylserine receptors, but then that creates the problem of why would inactivating something that would lead to enhanced phosphatidylserine on the outer mm. leaflet of the cell be a hit in, in mm. the screen? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, one possibility is that we were looking at infection and reinfection of cells. And so when we're producing particles out of the Mm -hmm. cells in which TMEM30A had been inactivated, they have a higher fraction of phosphatidylserine in their membrane and therefore have a potential to use PS receptors. But it's there are still challenges with that uh, uh, hypothesis, um, uh, among which we didn't observe any known PS receptors in our hit list. Um, Plus, there's no lipid flippase in the virus, so just by equilibrium, (laughs) we would expect to see PS levels Mm -hmm. uh, uh, change on the outer leaflet of the virus particles. What happened to the other two candidates? So the other two candidates, when we knocked them out in both haploid cells and endothelial cells, we still saw an inhibition of virus mm-hmm. infection. Mm-hmm. Um, and so neuropilin 2, NRP2, was one of those candidates. Uh, and this is a protein that's known to uh, uh, bind to uh, VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, and also uh, to interact with semaphorins. It's a plasma membrane protein? Yes, okay. it's present at the plasma membrane. And the structure of the protein uh, is also known, um, and it has uh, a series of uh, globular domains mm-hmm. that we were able to dissect them independently of one another and mapped the requirement for infection to a single one of those globular domains. Mm-hmm. The most uh, uh, proxim- the most uh, distal of those from the plasma membrane, the A1 domain. Do you think that's an attachment receptor on the cell surface? We do. Um, And the reason we think it's not sufficient Mm -hmm. for full infection is that if we take cells that express neuropilin 2 and we take cells that express lugoglycoprotein and mix them together, we cannot get cell-cell fusion to happen. Mm -hmm. 
uh, uh, even if we drop the pH to the pH right. at which fusion okay. occurs. So CD63 then must be our endosomal protein? Um, CD63 is uh, enriched in intraluminal vesicles. Mm-hmm. Um, intraluminal vesicles? Yes. What are those? So these are uh, vesicles within vesicles. So you have these multivesicular bodies right. that are uh, between early endosomes and late endosomes mm-hmm. during endocytosis. And it's enriched on those uh, ILVs. Got it. Um, and these have been uh, demonstrated to be important for infection of other viruses. Um, and uh, uh, so finding CD63 mm-hmm. and it being enriched in these compartments uh, um, may indicate the virus is using an interluminal vesicle in its entry pathway. Mm-hmm. But you're not sure of the exact mechanism. You don't know if it's a fusion-related mechanism yet, right? So we do know um, that it is somewhat related to fusion. So CD63 is a tetraspanin. And these proteins basically are involved in organizing uh, microdomains. Mm -hmm. And so um, what that raises the possibility of is CD63 organizing something that Lujo GP uses or CD63 itself is directly involved. Mm-hmm. So our efforts to detect a direct interaction between CD63 and Lujo GP uh, were unsuccessful. Um, but that doesn't mean they, they don't yeah, interact. Sure, sure. Um, um, but what we did was we used a variant of CD63 that targets uh, to the plasma membrane. So we increase the level of plasma mm-hmm. membrane CD63. And when we do that and we take cells that express Lujo GP and expose them to pH 5, then we see a robust cell-cell fusion. So CD63 or something that CD63 is organizing mm-hmm. helps and promote cell cell fusion. So there's the possibility it's CD63 directly, but there's also the okay. possibility it's not. Obviously, that's something you want to figure out, right? Yeah, we'd like to figure that okay. out. So that's three different entry uh, molecules. We're using this haploid screen. And I guess yes. you're doing some more, right? Yes. And do you still use these haploid cells, or have you converted so, the CRISPR based screen? Um, we have one more study that's actually not yet published, um, that we've done with the haploid cells. Um, and then a couple of other studies we've done, um, but we switched uh, quite a while ago now to using CRISPR-based screens to do this same uh, type of uh, uh, study. Um, and the reason we did this is not that the haploid cells have not been useful. Um, it's just the crispr base screens afford us the ability to do this in many more different cell types and in diploid cells, right? Um, which has advantages mm-hmm. for viruses that can't routinely infect mm. the haploid cells. And in, in fact, um, we, we ident- here in, in this lab, we identified the polio receptor many years ago in the 80s. 1989. It's hard. And I uh, had one student doing that and, um, if we were doing it today, we would use haploid cells or some such thing. And I noticed, I think Tim published a paper last year on um, on cell proteins needed for a picornavirus entry. And w- one of the control viruses he used, it was a haploid cell screen, was polio. And I was very happy to see the only hit he got was polio. Poliovirus receptor. That's it. Just one protein, you know. <laughs> Apparently, nothing. I mean, there are lo- there are lots of little bubbles, but you know the, yeah. p- the paper I'm talking about. Yes. It's a nature, big yeah. nature paper yeah. with yeah. Frank Van Kupeveld. Yeah, and interesting intracellular events going on yes. post post uh, uncoding, but um, yes, Coxsackie virus and polio, and they just both had just one yes. gene involved. So that was pretty cool to see. Yes. <laughs> um, let's end up with talking about how VSV gets into cells, because this is your true love. Yes. Even though you work on lots of different viruses. Yes. 
you're using VSV and you're re- and you really are interested in that virus. So from your discussions today, it's clear that VSV is somewhat different. So tell us how it gets into cells. So um, the history of VSV uh, entry factors um, is is long. I mean, you can get the virus to infect any cell type in cell culture, which is actually not unusual for rhabdoviruses in mm-hmm. general. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, a number of molecules have been reported to be important. Um, there's a, 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 a paper that goes back to 1984, and I think the title might be a little earlier, actually. It's a cell paper, and I think the title of the paper is Is, Ph- is Phosphatidylserine the Receptor for VSV, or, or, or something like that? Um, maybe 1978, uh, but it's, it's of that ilk. Um, and in fact, uh, um, data has accumulated, including binding of peptides of VSV to PS, over the years, um, that supports that PS may be involved. And then the structure of the glycoprotein was solved, and there's even a portion of the structure that looks like it combined PS. So, um, trying to find it while you're talking. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 so it turns out that, uh, you know, not, not much else had been published about what the virus uses as receptor until a, Study came from uh, the lab of uh, Menachem Rubenstein uh, in Israel uh, a couple of years ago or so now that was published in PNAS. And what that paper reports is that soluble LDL receptor blocks uh, VSV infection and interacts with the glycoprotein directly. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, that uh, this has led to the conclusion that the LDL receptor and its family members uh, serve as the receptor for VSV. This is not the case in insect cells. Um, and so I think um, even if the LDL receptor explains all of the infectivity of mammalian cells, there's another story about how the virus is getting in. There's a couple of other observations that I think uh, 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 are relevant here. And one is that if you take a planar lipid bilayer that doesn't actually have any uh, of the known receptors other than Mm -hmm. there's PS there, of course, um, you can get the virus to bind and you can get the virus to fuse with that uh, planar lipid bilayer. And in fact, what's been noted for many years is the the pH at which fusion occurs leads to a tenfold enhancement of virus binding to cells. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is work that goes back uh, 30 plus years. Um, and now that we know the, the structure of the glycoprotein, thanks to Yves Gordan in both pre and post fusion confirmations, what's unusual about the VSV glycoprotein um, in fact, it's common for all of the rhabdovirus glycoproteins, is they exist in this equilibrium between pre- and post-fusion conformers. And as you make the pH more acidic, then the proportion of the molecules that are in the post-fusion conformation increases and le- less acidic, uh, the proportion in the pre-fusion conformation increases. And this is a dynamic equilibrium. Um, in fact, some of the earliest evidence in support of this comes from work of Bob Doms. Um, so, uh, but Yves Gordan really demonstrated this beautifully mm. with rabies virus. So, um, it turns out that the binding of the virus is enhanced at the same pH that induces this conformational change. So at pH 6.2, you start to see an increase. And the structure of the glycoprotein reveals that Rather than a fusion peptide, the envelope protein of VSV has these sort of these two loops that have hydrophobic residues at their tips that are like sticky fingers that insert Mm -hmm. into the target membrane. And so really all VSV needs is to be in close proximity to a membrane Mm -hmm. in an acidified Mm -hmm. compartment, Mm -hmm. and it can insert the fusion machinery into the target membrane. So 
Um, and I think this is why you see efficient fusion right. with these planar lipid bilayers. Um, and so I think, you know, LDL may be helping the virus get into cells. Mm -hmm. Um, but mm -hmm. do you need LDL as a receptor molecule for VSV and how the virus gets into insect cells? It is a insect vectored virus. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think remains, uh, an open question. You think this, this uh, entry is, the way all the rhabdoviruses get in? Um, so rabies, again, is a very interesting case in point. A number of molecules have been identified by many labs over the years uh, for rabies virus infection. Those include uh, P75 NTR, which is uh, enriched on neuronal mm -hmm. cells, mm -hmm. neural cell adhesion molecule, the acetylcholine receptor, and also gangliosides. Um, so... Do we have the structure of the rabies glycoprotein? We don't have the structure okay. of the rabies glycoprotein. Um, uh, but you can model it based on the VSV mm -hmm. glycoprotein. Um, so uh, rabies glycoprotein undergoes this conformational rearrangement uh, in response to acid pH, as does another rhabdovirus, Chandipura. Mm -hmm. And um, it seems that this is a conserved property uh, uh, among a number of cool. these viruses. So I found the paper, 1983 cell. Oh, okay. The senior author is Ira Pastan. That's right. And uh, it's called Inhibition of VSV Binding and Infectivity by Phosphatidylserine. Is it a VSV binding site? Right. And so he was at Yale, I think. Oh, no. Ira Pastan was at the NIH, right? Yeah. I, I believe can't so. remember. Yeah. And, um, he was interested in virus entry because I know he, he developed the adenovirus model where it bursts out of the uh, endosomes by popping holes in right. the, That was originally his idea. That's right. And the first author is Richard Schlegel, who's also went on to a, a well-known career in science. Right. All right. That's interesting. Well, uh, thanks for talking with me today. Um, I'm going to let you go now. You can find TWIV at microbe.tv slash TWIV and any app that you use on your phone or tablet for listening to podcasts, please just subscribe to it. Get every episode. Send us your questions and comments, twiv at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, consider financially supporting us. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute to learn how to do that. My guest today from Harvard Medical School, Sean Whalen. Thanks for coming by and talking. Thank you, Vince. It's been a pleasure. It was fun. Twice in a month. You were you were last on in November, right? Uh, it was October. Was it October? Anyway, you, had, you do a lot of work, and uh, we appreciate your talking about it. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and the introductory music by Ronald Jenkins, ronaldjenkins.com. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.